So, here we are today. Uh, we are doing an interview with a few members of the fan subbing group Spectre Subs, who, if you've watched our videos that we released in October about Yokai Watch, you'll know that they have done an immense amount of work with uh, localizing the anime from that franchise, both the movies and the shows. Uh, so today, we were going to have them come on and talk to us about what the subtitling process is like. And sort of about some motivations for subtitling, stuff like that. Yeah. So. Do you want to introduce yourselves? Uh, sure. I'll go first. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Curb. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and they, them, by the way. Uh, I am one of the translators for Spectre Subs. I do mostly uh, the 2014 original series, though I pitch in to all the other ones every once in a while. And um, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. yeah of course. Thanks, Thanks for, for being here. Us. Uh, I'll go next then. Um, hello, my name is Clapchop. Um, my pronouns are he slash him, and I'm relatively new to Spectre subs, but yeah, I'm enjoying it. And um, I mostly, I, yeah, I translate the Yep I Watch 2019 series and do quality control here and there. Cool. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. My name is uh, Nate Stubbs. I also go by he, him. Uh, I do mostly translation work for the Y Academy series, although uh, I started doing work for the 2019 No Kai Watch series. And uh, I do translation for uh, the other series here and there whenever we need extra help. So. Uh, Cool. I also do a lot of uh, the typesetting. I don't do all of it, but I am gradually. Yeah. All right. Well, well, it's nice to meet you all. Yeah, um, thank you all for joining us. I, I assume you probably know that oh. I'm Eli. Wait. <laughs> wait, wait, a <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on. Wait a minute. I'm not Eli. That's Eli. <laughs> Did you do that on purpose? I, I'm not going to tell you if I did okay, that on purpose. Okay. I'm so I'm Eli. <laughs> I'm also Eli. <laughs> I'm Kylie, <laughs> and this is Eli. <laughs> we also have Chester right here. Yeah, on, Chester's um, always here whenever we're on lap, screen. So you might see him pop up from time to time. Yes. Just get used to it. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, the whole purpose of this video is to kind of discuss a little bit more in depth with people who actually do the thing, um, subtitling, and what the, that world is like. And I think we're actually going to get to see a little bit of inside knowledge and inside demonstration of how that works which is i am very excited yes, about because I'm, I'm very excited about i know that. very little about this so <laughs> i think this is going to be really really cool yeah because i i kind of feel personally i feel like it's a it's a side of watching anything that is anything that comes from another language it's a side of things that's just kind of taken for granted that, ah, yeah. Like, you don't even think about it. It's just like, yeah. oh, yeah, it's there. I have yeah. access to it. So, like, you don't even think about the people who put it, the work in. Unless you want something. Right. And yeah. it's not yes. available. Yes. And then you that's get all true. like, me, me, why has no one done it? Like, yeah, that's, that's fair. That's fair. So. But that's what these wonderful and amazing and beautiful people are for. Yes. They, oh, thank you. You are. Well, thank you. Honestly, truly. <laughs> the yeah. the like, amount of work that you've all done yeah, is like, insane. Th that's on. Like, the thanks goes to you. <laughs> all right. Hit us up with some questions. Okay. So I think we should just start out with some general questions. And then later on, we'll talk about your, your group, Spectre Subs. And then maybe towards the end, we'll talk a little bit more about each of your, like, personal experiences with uh, translating and subtitling in general. Mm -hmm. So... The first thing that we came up with was, uh, if if anybody has has familiar and any viewers have familiarity with um, Japanese in particular, but I'm sure this occurs in other languages as well. Uh, how how do you deal with either like nuance or idioms or phrases that are borderline untranslatable into English? How 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 do you deal uh, with that? Oh, like the itadakimasu. Yes, or like, like okairi or mm -hmm. hajime mashite. Mm -hmm. Phrases that have a literal meaning that doesn't make sense in English. How 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 do you deal with that sort of thing? 
and I think the ones that you mentioned in particular are some of the more easy ones because usually I just pick an equivalent uh, that's natural in English, like you know, "Hajimemashite," nice to meet you, "Itadakimas," you know, or like uh, something like uh, well, that one depends on sort of the character who's speaking. Like one of them could just be like you know, "Time to eat" or "Thanks for the grub." So it depends <laughs> on the character speaking. I think the hardest one is Yoroshiku, which can mean like 15 different things. So yeah. it's all context dependent. I'm going to probably repeat that uh, a couple of times. And that translation is just all entirely context dependent. Um, there's never really one way to do things uh, for the most part. That makes sense. Yeah. I agree with that. About the it being context dependent. Yeah, it's very heavily dependent on like, it's... It depends on the context and so, sometimes like depending on what it is it could especially if it's like a visual work it depends on what's going on mm -hmm. because it's a lot harder with printed work where it's just words you kind of have to guess there but with visual work it's all oh i never even thought about I hadn't that considered that mm -hmm. yeah so um yeah. Oh, we also ahead. have a lot of wordplay to deal with because <laughs> comedy series. Oh, we have my... some crazy wordplay. Oh my gosh. On. Well, J Japan and the puns, right? Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the white Henry character, Jinpei, likes to do a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, most of his jokes surround weird jokes or mishearing things. So that can really be hard sometimes. And yeah, yeah, sometimes what I do is. You know, I ask everybody what this should be. And for example, Neon helped me the other day, um, mm -hmm. helped me figure out what to write. Um, so that's bananas um, <laughs> is a, an example. It was like a banana yokai. So the idea is that Nate makes a, makes a pun about bananas. Mm -hmm. And then he's talking about how crazy this is. Is, and then so Neon helped me and said, you should put that's bananas and then right yeah so okay <laughs> okay that, that makes sense yeah that makes sense. so you really you have to have a a good base knowledge of not just japanese you actually mm -hmm. have to know a lot of idioms in english as well because like we, we were actually we, um we were eli wrote a script the other day and i was reading through it and he put a phrase in there i had never heard it before i don't even remember it was something about Burning the bank or something like that. Like, oh, oh, uh, uh, cooking, cooking the books. Cooking the books. Like, I had no idea what that meant. Putting, putting false numbers in in a ledger. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had to, I had to Google it. I was like, oh, what does this mean? <laughs> so I imagine you all have to have like a really good grasp of not just like the English language, but like even modern. Like you have to almost keep up with like how people are talking now, and to make sure that you continuously have those idioms and phrases like in your repertoire yeah that that plays into it like just how people are talking to pen nowadays like japanese slang mm -hmm. uh i think i think like i don't know if this technically would count but like some of the references that they make like i noticed in the earlier episodes of the anime like they would reference you know japanese dramas and th they'd be like mm -hmm famous ones or at least ones that like maybe the kids okay but nowadays in like why academy they will reference i don't know if it's just obscure to us because we're not japanese but like they'll reference like 60s dramas that oh you know you know curve will go through and look on websites just on the japanese side of the internet and end up finding it i i don't i don't even know how <laughs> seriously yep. one of the best skills to doing something like this is learning how to research like google is your best friend oh my gosh yes. finding different dictionaries like i'll have japanese to japanese dictionaries open all japanese to english dictionaries open and you know also and like yeah, somehow there's even like yahoo answers because uh <laughs> yahoo answers is still pretty popular in japan Oh, uh, okay. And colloquialisms okay. and things. So yeah, a lot of research goes into things like this, especially a comedy series where they're throwing in parodies and puns everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah, Yokai Watch is always filled to the brim with parodies, and some of them, yeah, like like they're always super obscure ones that I never catch. But then some guy points it out. I'm like, oh wow, that is true. Yeah. <laughs> The original oh. Yokai Watch, for example, there was like this one episode with like four parodies in one little segment. 
Oh, wow. And I mean, they, they just like, for example, they copy a dance move and a song from a popular songwriter and oh. they, they reference, they have this blatant Star Wars <laughs> Wars parody. <laughs> and it's yeah, they're really good at adding references and parodies to everything they make. Yeah, and then if you don't have that knowledge base, then it it ends up being lost, like lost in translation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> Omg, I, I, <laughs> you said that you said I the thing. <laughs> it's just the first phrase that came I mean, to it's mind. True. <laughs> I, it's true. It's true. That's that's really interesting. I, I I hadn't I hadn't considered that that you need. Like it's it's beyond just those daily phrases that are somewhat difficult to translate that are context based, but it, it sounds like you're saying it also goes into having a working knowledge of anything that they might be referencing and being able to portray that to an audience that wouldn't necessarily understand those those references or that slang. Yeah, that that's pretty much it. Occasionally, I usually try to keep the original references in. But I believe there was at least one instance in, um, there was one episode in the original series where the whole concept of it is they, like, parody popular movies and dramas and stuff, and oh. it's like, the yokai get together in a boardroom and they say, okay, let's make this an episode. Oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> and so I think I changed one that was, like, this drama, or, no, I don't know if it was a drama or, like, a documentary type show that nobody would get, um... That was watching the English sub, so I changed it to a reference to like my big fat Greek re- wedding or something like that. I see. Because that makes like, sense. we'll probably go more into this later, but I try yeah. to keep things as close to the original as possible. But if it's just gonna completely fly over people's heads and nobody's gonna think it's funny, then sometimes I'll go back in and and do a little bit of alteration. Okay. Yeah, Mission yeah. Young Possible I'm... was a thing, in the original <laughs> series. <laughs> Yeah, like Mission Impossible, I think everybody's going to get that for the most part. Yeah, yeah. And stuff like Mr. Krabby Cat is just pretty obscure to an uh, international audience. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, because it's based I, I think, like, the drama's called, like, uh, like Kinpachi Sensei or something like that. Yeah. It was a very long-running drama in Japan, so mm-hmm. I think... And they based that whole character off of the teacher from that drama uh i'm you know honestly i i would be very interested in seeing you know if the english dub had continued and went as far as to get to that boardroom side series i'd be really interested in how they would go about doing some of those parodies because a lot like Kerr mentioned a lot of them are like japanese dramas that don't have much I did forget one example that I really wanted to talk about when we were talking about um, the kind of liberties that we take in translation and things. Yeah. Um, my new favorite example. Uh, I'm sorry for the spoilers for the movie, but um, okay. we have our new favorite phrase is um, when Junpei uh, describes the meaning of YSP. In Japanese, he says, Yabai kurai ni sticking a person, which is like super special kind of, uh, it's almost like a slangy way to say a really cool person. Mm-hmm. And um, <laughs> what we did is we turned it into yellow swag person. And that has become that was an instant hit that I actually can't take oh. credit for. Um that was a friend of mine that came up with that when I explained we were having trouble coming up with an acronym for that. That's, that's good. So now the whole yeah. community has this inside joke of YOLO swag person. And oh I, I think God. that's just a good example of showing that, you know, people kind of like they kind of scorn the idea of quote unquote memes. And like mm-hmm. certain lingo in translation, they think, oh, it's not accurate enough to the original. But I think the most important thing about translation is getting the right reaction from people. So yeah, if people are yeah. laughing at a part that you're that the author intends for you to laugh at, then you have to be doing something right. Yeah. And, you know, and it's also in character for this character because he's like yeah, yeah. a middle schooler. This, this is something yeah. that he would <laughs> completely say. He's he's kind of like he's kind of I mean. I don't know. He's not necessarily supposed to be a smart character. He's more of the uh, he's, he's more the Eli character. <laughs> what is that? Protagonist that cares about his friends a lot, but isn't necessarily too smart. Yes, you know? I hear you. Yeah, he, he's kind of like that, and he makes a lot of pun jokes. He 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 says a lot of jokes, mm-hmm. you know. So that sounds perfect. Then I, mean, 
<laughs> yeah, so <laughs> well, I, I think that's something that people should really consider when they like criticize certain decisions a translation makes about like, you know, is it too much like shoving memes kind of I mean there are issues where like sometimes it's inappropriate, but again it's all very context dependent, character dependent. It's never a simple answer, yes or no, is this a good translation or not? Right. Yeah. 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 I I remember that when Curb suggested that in the when we were first going over the movie when we had everything done and that was that was in the half that I did mm-hmm. and I rem- I remember writing originally I wrote a line that was just like I, I fit it into the acronym but it was kind of just like normal and when Curb first suggested that I was like uh, I don't know because I, I I just felt like it. It didn't really fit as well, but over time I warmed up to it, and I'm very glad that I didn't like put my. Yeah, no, everybody. It ended up being. Yeah, it ended up being memorable, and everybody liked it. So. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's that's awesome. That's, that's awesome. That's what you're aiming for. Yeah, I I think actually that talking about uh using different cultural references and mm-hmm. trying to use different uh, slang or idioms from both languages and moving them from one to the other actually segues kind of nicely into our next question, which was, as a, as translators, do you all feel like you have uh, like personal voices when with what you're working on? Or do you try to remove yourself as much as possible? Or do you try to like take on a different voice for each character that sort of thing i guess like like a a way that i could ask that like in a different way is Uh as in your group are you able to tell like oh that person did that and that person did that even if you don't know who did it you can just tell by the way it's done i don't i would say i'm not entirely sure about the latter part if we can tell each other apart kind of sort of i think there's some things that we do differently like some of us disagree on whether we should be putting Nyan at the end of Jibanyan sentences or not. I don't. I think Nyan, I think you do sometimes. Um, I, so I do if I can fit it into a poem. Yeah, there's like little <laughs> things like that. Well, I, I do that too. I just replace like some instances of N with Nya. Like, um, every like, once in a while I add. Yeah, every once in a while I add Nya or Meow at the end of a sentence. Mm-hmm. And yeah, for Komasan, sometimes I. The first time I subbed an episode, I put Zura, and then the next time I subbed an episode, I don't think I put Zura. So, okay, <laughs> that was also. And we all have, we all have different translations from Monge, etc. But other than that, um, even though I feel like I have a sort of distinctive voice when translating, because I think it's kind of impossible to avoid something like that, because in the end, you are writing in a sense. Um, I was an English major; my associate's degree is in English, so okay. I, I did a. a fair bit of uh, writing creative and otherwise beforehand so I've had a lot of time to develop my voice but I also try to um, take on the different characters as well like for characters like Whisper for example um, who's very posh I'll often put a higher level of vocabulary uh, oh. into his speech and you know sometimes I'll give like Komasan his little southern accent uh, <laughs> I'll give um rough raft the kind of like uh i'll try to emulate the brooklyn accent that they do in the dub a little bit <laughs> um or at least make him more like slurred in his speech sort of so that kind of thing i do try to get into the characters and get into the intent um that the writers had with the characters but i think it's a little hard to completely avoid your own bias and your own uh style of writing leaking through a little bit yeah yeah that totally makes sense mm-hmm. that, that does and this was something I was actually thinking about a couple of weeks ago, just by coincidence. It's just, yeah, the way I write is going to be different from how everyone else writes. So, well, I, I, I guess mean, I'm pretty much. I think I could think whatever. of an example like, um, like I write the word gray, like the color, G R E Y, and I know other people who write it G R A Y, mm-hmm. and so like that's not something that I'm cognizant of while I'm while I'm writing, you know? So, like, that might come through. And so you might have one person put G-R-A-Y and another person put G-R-E-Y. Um, yeah. Is there any, like, do you all ever have any kind of anything where you, like, look back and you're like, oh, like, we spelled that differently? Or do you just kind of, like, not worry about that? I think so. Yeah, actually, we just had that. Um, when I think we all, like, collectively missed the misspelling of... Um, 
of Gakoga or uh, the the, the yeah, robot the, that they had, yeah, in Y Academy. I think we like just completely forgot about it. Um, so that does happen occasionally. Yeah. Um, there's also there's also instances where like, uh, I, when I watch an episode and I do like the preview for the next episode, I translate one of the titles one way, and then I'll get to the episode itself, and I'm like, actually, I like this better, and so the title will be different. Oh, that's, the final oh. Episode. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like everybody in the group does add some amount of personal flair to it, whether it's intentional or not, mm-hmm. basically. Yeah, I, th- I think that's fair to say. Okay. That's cool. That's That, that makes sense. And, and it makes sense that you, in certain cases, wouldn't even be able to just... You wouldn't be able to remove your voice from it entirely. Yeah, I mean, I think because you're not a robot, right? Like you're not like you. <laughs> you're are... not. Yeah, you're not Google Translate. You're not Google Translate. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. Google Translate has a very strong voice. <laughs> Google Translate has its own voice. I don't think any other translator will translate the way the Google Translate does. Okay. <laughs> oh yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Get on to your next question. <laughs> All right. Um. Oh, so something something that we came across in uh, just kind of trying to research like the history of subtitling and also commonalities uh, with subtitling, whether it's fan subtitling or whether it is like more professional, like official releases in a different region. Uh, Something that we came across that I definitely remembered from when I was a kid was Mm -hmm. your, uh, a a dub of an anime will usually be like a retooled script that is taking into account the amount of time that the actors will have to give the lines whereas the subtitles for the same release will be different from the lines that are given to the dub because the subtitles are usually more inclusive of like everything that is being said in the original they don't have the time constraints do all of you or do do you all feel at all that the the anime industry or the fan subtitling uh more specifically uh do you think that there could be anything that's done to sort of bridge the gap between like differently abled people like people who use dubs or use subs uh out of necessity or even just people who prefer one or the other so that they're all getting the same experience more or less um well we do something that i don't see a lot of fan subs do which is we include uh dialogue tags for sound effects um and if a character is off screen we'll include like a thing in brackets to indicate who's uh who's speaking that's done more for for uh like deaf and hard of hearing people but um that's something you see in closed captions for like regular movies even if it's like something in the same language um Mm -hmm. so i i think that's one thing that we do that i think dubs and subs could both use officially um that's more of an accessibility thing than like an actual translation thing, mm-hmm. but um, that's one thing. And uh, what else do I have here? I think that in terms of the uh, time constraints thing, we have that a little bit uh, because we still have, they still are on screen for a limited amount of time. So if our line is too long, we'll have to chop it down sometimes oh. um, or split it into two. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. So that so they're not only like with the dub, but you're having time constraints with like like literally like the spoken, the animated mm-hmm. part. Um, but then when you get to subs, where it could be longer, but like if you want it to be the same. I see. Like, okay. Yeah. Y- you know yeah. what I mean. Yeah. Like so. it still has to sync with the audio. So. Um, right. Yeah. 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 And do, in in that case, do you find that you have to worry about people not being able to read fast enough? Like you need to put mm-hmm. a small enough amount of text that it's able to be read. Yeah, definitely. Um, when whenever I sub and and on age of sub, it kind of, you know, the number CPS kind of tells you the more read it is, the harder it is for the viewer to read oh. in that amount of time. Okay. And so when I know what the script says, I just kind of automatically think I'll I can read this and when I play it, I already know the word, so I just kind of automatically think think that I'm reading it. Mm-hmm. But I feel like for people who don't know the script already, it might be 
part and they, they have to play it back sometimes to see the full lyrics. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. That, I, that actually makes sense for me specifically because I uh, on my channel, I have a lot of text on screen and I ha I run into that as well where I, like, I'm watching the video and I'm like, oh, I was able to read that. I could shorten it. And I'm like, no, I can't shorten it. Like, I'm the one who wrote it. I know what it says. So I should make, I should keep it the length it is. Like I try, it's, it's hard because you like have that in your head. You can't like, you can't come at it from a different angle. Like you almost have to have somebody who's never been exposed to the words to look at it in order to read like, it. Like as a, as a proofreader. Yeah. Like as like a, to have that like speed. Yeah. The, to have the understanding of how, but, but people read different, like even that, like people read different ways. So that's true. Yeah. Yeah. People, people have different reading speeds. We'll probably, we'll get into a little bit later about, um, our QC proofreading stuff because okay. we do have that. Um, okay, but cool. one interesting thing is that Iggy Sub actually does, uh, Iggy Sub is the program which we use to do subtitling uh, for viewers who don't know. Um, it does have uh, one of the boxes on the left side of the script uh, counts characters per second. And um, oh. you can set a threshold where um, if the there's too many characters per second, it'll like highlight the box in red. Um, to show you that maybe this line is a little too long uh, based on the threshold you set for like how long should a line be on screen and something like that. So I think that's interesting um, and that it is conscious of that issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Although their uh, personal uh, thing that I do is, you know, sometimes you'll have AG Sub will tell you, okay, uh, the value will be 18, which it's starting to get more red at 18. If you have a line, you and it's basically telling you, think about shortening the, ah, sorry about that. Uh, think about shortening this. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think sometimes, especially when it's like in the faint, like almost on the borderline between white and red, it's like fading in because it'll fade in the more you type. Um, mm -hmm. I think sometimes it'll come down to your choice of words because there's like certain phrases like if you're using simpler words and it's just like a little bit longer than the max it'll be at white you know mm -hmm. i usually leave it in that long because the chances are the average person will be able to process those smaller and simpler words uh, in a shorter amount of time mm -hmm. uh Sometimes when it's like really long lines that stretch out uh, beyond a couple seconds, uh, I will split it up into two separate lines so it gets its own value and it makes it's less work that the viewer has to do. Okay. Um, I use in the red. It's not a like end all be all, but there there's sometimes where the uh, the value thing like when it's red, it's like you have to change this. But uh, there, because there's sometimes where you'll have a line that kind of can't really shorten as much as you want, or as much as it's telling you it wants you to possible because you, mm -hmm. and you just kind of have to roll with it. Uh, but yeah, and I, I mean that I think that's like being conscientious to that is important because like as somebody who like is trying to get to the point that I can watch anime without having to use subtitles. Uh, I like when I'm reading, I read as fast as I can so that I can like look at the screen and then look back down and then look at the screen and then look back down. So like having that moment to take a look at what is actually being presented, like the actual, the art, the animation, the, you know, visually what is there. It's, it's so nice to have that moment instead of just like reading the words the whole time you're watching. <laughs> You had mentioned uh, including certain things in your subtitles that are things that you would more expect out of like closed captioning, mm -hmm. uh, like for the the deaf or the hard of hearing. Um, and I've I've also noticed sometimes you'll use like either different fonts or different colors of font. And we were finding again in our research that in certain Asian countries uh, where subtitling on TV is more of the uh, norm. It, it, it's it's not like an exceptional thing like it would be necessarily in America. Um, but they do those sort of things, like those sort of like adding flavor to subtitles. But that 
here, at least in America, that's not really a common thing. Mostly it's just white or yellow subtitles and that's it. Uh, do you all think that the broader su subtitling in general, in general, but more specifically the broader anime industry could benefit from adding more flavor like that? And rather than having subtitles just be like a utilitarian thing. Uh, Neon, you're probably the best for this question, <laughs> considering you've become one of our more frequent typesetters. Um, yeah. And as we discussed earlier, we uh, we do a lot of it. So. <laughs> um, I would say that when it when it comes to the industry, mm -hmm. you know the the closest ex the closest example I have to because are you asking like the dialogue text itself for like the like signage like both I, think both. May, uh... I, I actually saw an example of like two different characters having different fonts every time they spoke they, they were speaking yeah right yeah mm -hmm. hmm. uh, well i feel like the, the closest entity i could compare a situation like that to is like crunchyroll uh okay. most of the time crunchyroll either does bare minimum quote-unquote typesetting or they just don't do it at all and they just give you text and that's it um and i've i've seen some anime on crunchyroll that they'll they'll get creative with the fonts uh they won't do intricate stylings they won't mask out text and put english over it mm -hmm. but they'll put they'll put stuff next to it and they'll they'll go the extra mile but they won't fully go the extra mile and okay. i feel like if if you're gonna make it look like you want to go the extra mile then no Siri, <laughs> stop that <laughs> um so when you when you have cr companies like Crunchyroll who is kind of like an in, in between, you know, going all the way and going not all the way, mm -hmm. um, I don't really see it as, um, I don't really see it as worth it in the capacity that they do it now, where it's just plain text, and they'll use uh, just basic fonts like pre-installed. I, I, and, <laughs> and impact and just very basic fonts right and i feel like if you're if you're not going to put in the effort then you're just better off doing the the overhead top margin mm -hmm. just plain text just like the subtitles and i, I personally don't really like the look of that Mm -hmm. Unless you absolutely necessarily have to do that because it's just impossible to do anything else. But I feel like I feel like um, most people who watch subtitles through those methods, they're really not looking for the visual flair. They'd rather have it as raw as they can, which... You know, Crunchyroll obviously understands that because they just a lot of right. so. I mean that that's my personal view on it, because uh, ty typesetting like this is fairly common only in fan. Generally, the point um, is more so for immersion. So mm -hmm. um, by adding by typesetting the signage on screen in the same like similar fonts and colors and movements to. The Japanese text is supposed to give a sort of similar experience for the viewers of the subs that the original viewers, the Japanese viewers had, which is sort of going into what we were talking about before with the the um, subtitle length and things like that, um, trying to replicate the experience. Um, I do think stuff like different fonts for each character is a little on the opposite end of the spectrum. I think it's a little bit immersion breaking maybe because then it kind of toes the line between distinctive and distracting. We do all this complicated typesetting basically in order to make it look as close to the original as possible. And, you know, it does show um, putting a little bit of effort into it. Uh, but I do think one reason why the official companies don't do this is a lot of it is time constraints. Um, mm, I don't yeah, know if they really have dedicated typesetters uh, in companies like Crunchyroll. Uh, they're, 
practices are like a little bit in the dark, but we do know that um that it's mostly translators doing the work on these episodes. I'm not sure if they have the kind of roles that sub fan subgroups have. And this is something that's very traditional to fan subbing. Um mm-hmm. all the, like all the typesetting stuff is like a huge culture around uh typesetting for fan subs. So okay. it, it's definitely fascinating. Okay. What like could you super brief like just give like what are some of the roles in the fan sub community like if typesetter is one and like what those roles entail um yeah the typesetter is um like uh, what neon does a lot is just uh dealing with the fonts on screen uh placing text animating text uh sometimes our other typesetters will draw like vectors and things that need to go on screen uh, oh. to redraw over something. Uh, so that's one part of the process. Obviously, you have your translators. Um, could be one or more than one. depends on the project. Uh, we'll probably talk about that later. Also, mm-hmm. uh, timers are responsible for syncing the on-screen subtitles with the audio. Um, and then there's varying amounts of quality checking and proofreading and mm-hmm. things like that. Those okay. are like the traditional... Oh, and there's also... Who, the person who encodes the subtitles onto video, which is we have another uh, member of our group, Nori and Ahanako does that okay. for us most of the time. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So so at least five different like distinct jobs that all kind of work work together mm-hmm. to to do the to to make sure the entire thing works properly. Mm-hmm. It sounds like. Yes. Yeah. In, in some other groups, you have a few extra roles. You'll have uh, encoders who make sure that the video source that you get is pristine, tip-top shape. Uh, usually, we forego that unless we're uploading hard subs because soft subs just are the raw footage that we get from uh, our source. And then... You'll have, uh, you know, like Kurt said, varying amounts of quality control. Uh, some people, I, I know groups that will just get a big Discord room and just watch the episode together, and they'll just point out any flaws, and it'll get fixed on the spot. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think, actually, that that's probably a good a, a good transition point to start talking about your group in like, particular. Yeah, your group specifically. Yeah. yeah. So actually, one, one of the first things that we wanted to ask was, do you have multiple translators work on a single project, like one episode or one movie, or is it generally just one person doing each project? Uh, well, um, for the animist, uh, usually per episode, you have one person translating, one person will do the whole thing. I don't think we've had any episodes yet where we've split up the work between more than one person it's usually just one person does the translation um that person might also do typesetting if they have time and it's a light episode Uh, i know some of our members will do that if Mm -hmm. um typesetting on the other hand uh that can be done by we usually we do one to two people it just depends on the load and the complexity um and then quality control is basically done by everyone else who i mean it's done by everyone i I shouldn't say quality control i should say translation check it's done by someone else who hasn't okay um, i see and and then we do quality control checks we make sure subtitles are timed correctly we make sure none of the fonts are missing uh, if we catch any typos, those are ironed out. And uh, other than that, there's not really much. Like, I think the only projects where all of us have translator duty is like the movie. I don't think we did. I think we all worked on Forever. Yeah. Forever, the only ones where we all do some. We'll split up the episode. Not episode. I'm sorry. We'll split up the movie into mm-hmm. equal parts, and we're like, okay this person does this part, this person does this part, and uh, at the end, we all stitch it together, and then we continue the process, but um, for, for translation, uh, at least for the anime. Okay. 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 That makes sense. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. We sort of have a setup where it's one or two people handle, because, uh, you know, now that there's 
four separate series of the bigger series. <laughs> um, we have one person or two people usually in charge of each one. Like I usually handle uh, original series um, along with, I, I think I've been, I alternated for a little bit with two of our other members, but that's mm-hmm. primarily my project. Um, Neon and Clapchop are primarily the 2019 series. Norio and Hanukkah is primarily Shadowside and Neon is primarily Y Academy. And so sometimes we pitch into each other's series as like a fill in, but, uh, it's we kind we mostly have like a project head of sorts doing the translation for each one. Okay. Okay, that's really cool. I I I I I don't know what I was expecting as far as how it was set up, but that I I don't think that was it to have like one person in charge or one one like head person in charge of each of them, but that totally makes sense in especially I'm I'm sure that probably helps with like consistency, right? Mm. Yeah, and I mean our situation of course is particularly unique because um it's not a singular anime anymore now it's four right. anime. Right. So <laughs> yeah. most most fan subbing groups do not have that uh conflict to be working with, but we you know that's just our way of making it work. Yeah. I I, I would like to stress uh you know, I don't really like talking about the group in this sort of way but i i, I do want to be like transparent mm-hmm. uh a lot of fan subgroups at least like the the most known ones like uh like the job media or commie subs um they do not operate the way we do and that is a that's probably a good thing we we're kind of all over the place because for most of us this is just a hobby mm-hmm. and we're just doing things when we can and we're we're such a small group and we cater to a relatively small fan base but we have the workload of groups that size you know mm-hmm. that have tens of members mm-hmm. and uh so we we don't we we gradually improve our methods but uh it's still i I've had a lot of people ask us, you know, how do you do this? You should do videos on how to do this. And I don't, I don't really like talking about it that much because I feel like if, if someone's like genuinely interested in learning how the process works, like down to like a T, like we, I wouldn't mind sharing Mm-hmm. The, the switch mm-hmm. personally if you're watching at home insight but i i really want to stress to them especially if they want to learn how to like do stuff like them i wouldn't suggest unless you know what you're doing uh, <laughs> i i don't i just don't think like as much as i hate to say this and it sounds weird coming from someone who's part of the group i don't think our group is the best uh example on how to do things because we <laughs> things very very different from other groups that i feel like you know the general I... procedure for most groups is more like an assembly line i think we have more of a um a bit more of an all hands on deck approach uh as I far see. as like all of us sort of do qc on each other's um and yeah. so and we do jump from project to project a lot so um, it is different in that sense compared to how most fans of group operate, but we still have like the basic roles in place uh, mm-hmm. for for each person uh, in a sense. There's always that one person who tells us to focus on this one series more, and we're, you know, we're all we're trying to do each series, and mm-hmm. there's that one guy who wants this series, but we're working on another yeah, one at the moment. Right. I feel like that. I feel that's a really big sort of point to talk about because, mm-hmm. you know, given how small we are, mm-hmm. and yeah. you have different <laughs> parts of the community wanting different things out of us. Yeah, know, it's it gets kind of uh, it gets kind of it's it's hard to deal with because. You have some people who were like, no, we want the original series. And then you have other people who are like, no, when are you going to do the Y Academy? And then you have, like, no one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's, a, that's a bit more of a... By the way, I brought you all here for one purpose. And that was... No. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Oh, I, I get that, though. I imagine because you are tackling different projects, you have fans who are pulling you in different directions and that 
would that that I mean that is hard because I mean being content creators ourselves like you know you have fans who who want something specifically and, and you want to like be there for them you and you you want to you want to give them what they're asking for but you only have so much mental capacity <laughs> to, yes. to do this I wish, when somebody yeah. asked for an episode i wish i could just be like yeah we have it right here yeah but the, there are always those people who are like oh my god you crunchy roll suppers do it in one week and oh. you guys take like three months and then but but like yeah yeah we take longer but we don't have as many people and that's what nobody can comprehend yeah <laughs> well and I, I, aren't comparable either it's it's a bit of a different modus operandi between mm -hmm. us and the simul subs which is another thing is that um we've kind of come to terms with the fact that we're not really playing catch up in the sense that we expect to be on time with the broadcast because of like how wild this series has gotten and also the fact that we had the series passed on to us after um the previous subber who did uh like the first half of the 2014 series dropped it and then it was in limbo for a year so we already kind of lost oh, time that way okay, um okay. but on the flip side i think that also gives us more time to be able to polish these subs as best as we can because we're not pressured to be in time crunch catch-up mode we have mm -hmm. pretty much as much time as we need because you know we're already behind so we're not struggling to to go 50 episodes in advance yeah, so yeah. yeah. there's pros and cons to it mm -hmm. i i think that like you know going back to what Black i was saying earlier about people who were like you know, crunchy rule subbers do it in a day you know, I think a lot of people kind of forget in the grand scheme of things that, going back to what I said earlier, this is a hobby, mm -hmm. and Crunchyroll translators get paid and get access to scripts before yeah. broadcast. They get it a week in advance, I believe, something like that. They, they definitely yeah. get a script in advance, whereas um, we're kind of just going off of, like, you know, what's already been released. Yeah, we we can't even like the earliest we could start working on a brand new episode is like using the raw source that we have. The earliest we could start working on an episode is a week after broadcast. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. when they start going up on Netflix. Yeah, the raw oh. rippers aren't like as there used to be other rippers, but I don't think they stay mm -hmm. on top of it anymore. I see. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And you know, going back to what Curb was mentioning about keeping up with broadcast i i will talk about this later but i've personally done fan subs for an anime where i i essentially did that and it i it is very hard it's incredibly hard especially when you don't have the episode any of the episode materials until after broadcast and you have to get it out you know i set a goal for myself to get it out 24 hours after broadcast and it's it's yeah well, yeah, and it, it's it sounds like even even for the the sort of larger groups that you're talking about that have like tens or dozens of people, or or even for um, translators who are doing this as a job, uh, it sounds like it's a really really thankless process. So to have people on top of that saying. Oh, you know, give me, give me. Yeah, you've got you got three or four hundred <laughs> episodes total out, across the four series. Like, why aren't you doing the specific one that I want? Oh yeah. Out of, that that's that's got to be that's got to be really tough. Um, especially because you know that they like the same thing that you like. So like, <laughs> yeah. It's... And when somebody says that, you want to tell them try it out for yourself, but they don't know the they don't even know the language, so <laughs> you can't really tell them to go try this and experience it for yourself you know it's mm -hmm. they're just w waiting the whole time for it uh why don't you tell us a little bit about the the history uh whether it's uh specter subs or if there is anything before specter subs that we don't know about uh tell tell us some about the history of translating uh the yokai watch franchise mm -hmm. we have a couple of different translators did like the first few episodes up until maybe the first 25 uh, close to when it was airing. Um, then another sub group, which was really one person um, called Monge Subs, uh, did it, I believe, for episode 30 to 112 um, of the original 2014 series. I think for a short period of time, uh, she was caught up uh, with the broadcasts. Um, then what happened is that she had to drop the series for a couple of different reasons. 
And basically after that, it was in limbo for a year because it was just nobody picked it up uh, for whatever reason, just lack of interest, lack of, of people available, whatever it was. Um, then I had started subbing for fun recently, teaching myself how to do it. Um, mm -hmm. And me and one other person um, got together to do, uh, I think we started from 113 and we did a few episodes together and that was under a different group name before Spectre Subs. Um, after like four episodes of that, that person had to drop out. Uh, and then I sort of stopped for a while and then I got into contact with, well, what happened first really was Nori and Ahanako, who uh, you guys know uh, as being in our group now, they picked up the series by themselves as well. So I, you know, I contacted them and I said, well, why don't we start working together uh, on the series? Uh, and what happened is they had picked it up from the newest episode. So what we decided to do was like they can work on it from the newer episodes and I can go back and fill out the backlog. And so we worked like that for a okay. couple of years, I think, until um, Neon and another person all kind of started jumping on uh, other episodes as well. And eventually last year, not last year, this is 2021, I forgot. Oh, uh, 2019. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 2019, we sort of just all said, you know what, let's all get together because now there were multiple different series at this point. Let's all work on it instead of being in like three different groups and that's how we we oh. got to specter subs so it has okay. been a long and winded history that's, of your i watch fan subs it um, sounds like actually, it yeah yeah that's kind of interesting <laughs> yeah so, yeah i have like all the time frames memorized and everything but i don't want to get into the long version right before the subgroup uh was formed i did um I did an episode of the 2019 series. I think I did like episode uh, three or four because I think Noro and Felicity did one or two before that. Yeah, probably, probably. But uh, I was like, wow, I want to do more because uh, Felicity was like, I'm not going to do any more. So I was like, well, I could just keep going. But then after doing four, I was like, there is absolutely no way that I'm going to be able to manage this all. I see. So. So I, I brought it up with everyone. I got them all together. I was like, hey, do you think this might be a good idea? And uh, we, it was like the end of May, and we were all like, yeah, it might be a good idea. So uh, we just, it was kind of a spur of the moment thing, too. I was just like, huh, let's see if this will work. And uh, So this, this was May 2019, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. That, that's awesome. That, it's, that's really cool. And so... Is it because your primary focus is Yokai Watch that you went with, with the name Spectre Subs, or is there like, is there more to that story? I, no, it's it's not as deep as you may think. It's literally just because I was like, well, if we're gonna do this Yokai stuff, we might as well have a, a Yokai. Yeah. That was the best I came up with. I, I, thought, it, I thought it rolled off the tongue. Well, yeah. oh, no, it don't. It totally I, I think it's a does. Great it totally name. does. And Spectre stuff specifically, does that group only do Yokai Watch? Um, um, when we set out, like, when we set out and started, uh, that's pretty much all we've done. And even now, that's pretty much all we've done. Although, like, Felicity does um, subs for the Snack World. Uh, which is another one of Level 5's anime series that right. ties in mm -hmm. one of their games and toy lines. Uh, and she does that independently, but mm -hmm. a lot of us from Spectre Subs help her out with that. So, okay. um, I, I mean, it, it's technically not one of our releases, but, I mean, at the same time... I see. Other yeah, than that... We have independent projects here and there that sometimes will help each other with his fellow translators. But yeah, like mm -hmm. at, under the group name, it's only OK Watch. OK, okay. Yeah. I see. So you, you have like side projects as well. Yeah. OK. Yes. That's yeah, awesome. At the moment, I'm working on subtitling a Komasan McDonald's ad from Japan. <laughs> That's amazing. That's incredible. <laughs> it's been really fun. That sounds awesome. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> do you want to go ahead and do like a quick demonstration? No? Sure. Well, uh, to give a tour to everybody, uh, this is the program that we use. It's called uh, AD Sub. Uh, this is actually industry standard. So uh, 
not only do fan subbers use this program, but uh, companies like, uh, I know Disc, uh, Discotech Media uses it, and uh, even Crunchyroll translators, they will use this program to produce their subtitles. Okay. Um, and this is an average view of an episode. This episode in particular is uh, Y Academy episode 22, which uh, by the time this video goes up, it'll probably be uh, quite a while until this goes out live to the public, but uh, this is a very early work in progress of the episode, so I would just like to note that what you see here may not be how it is in our final version. Um, but the setup is mainly the same. You have your video feed right here. Over here is your audio. You have a field for your text. And down here is the timeline. So all of your subtitles are right here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, usually what I do, and this isn't really the best way to go about doing things, but uh, I will watch the episode. Uh, and I have caption files here. So... Uh, so they'll pop up while I'm watching, and uh, like something very basic that I uh, usually what I do is I watch the episode first, uh, and if there's like, like the jot down, I'll stop it. And the second one I go through, and then line by line, I put out a rough sort of translation or like more exact, mm -hmm. and then. I will go back, like, as I'm going through, I will think up, uh, like, better ways to uh, word it so it sounds more natural in English. Uh, but this is pretty much our view for most episodes. Uh, we just we go through and uh, do the lines. Uh, the I do want to mention really quick um, about the Japanese captions because... Um... That's actually something that we're very lucky to have ripped from us uh, by outside, uh, or ripped by outside contributors. I, sometimes they go straight from the TV broadcast. Um, are these the Amazon ones or the Netflix ones? Uh, this is the Amazon one. Okay, okay yeah. yeah. So uh, these are put up online or ripped straight from those streaming services. Because okay. I know a lot of older fan subbers, you know, they had to go by ear uh, because they, these captions weren't available. So we're extremely glad to have these. I think they help translating accurately a lot. I'm sure. I'm uh, yeah, sure. I, I imagine. Because, like, I mean, as somebody, I, I wouldn't say I'm, like, very fluent in Japanese, but, like, if as I have... Who's learning it. As somebody who's learning. Yes. Um, if I have the words on screen with the kanji and, you know, I can see all the different um, parts that are there, it is so much easier to... Yes. Get an understanding. Like I, I, reading is so much easier for me than listening. So much easier. Best way to learn. It's definitely it's easier for me too. I mm -hmm. think you know it's yeah. definitely a good thing to have. If you had to, to keep listening to it so that you could, you could try and translate it, it that would be really difficult. Definitely. You mm -hmm. know, <laughs> actually be able to see it and then. For example, highlight something, think about what you're going to put there, delete it, and then type that. That mm -hmm. can make it really... Yeah, it's just super simple when you do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Because yeah. when, when, like, uh, uh, what do you call it? When, like, dialects or just people's different voices, and, like, especially if they, like, slur their speech or anything like that, mm -hmm. that's got to be a nightmare if you don't have oh, yeah. subtitles <laughs> going in. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, real quick, I... oh gosh, the oh, catchphrases. True. Yeah. I just wanted to mention that I switched over to a uh, different version of the script because I realized the one I had pulled up was not recent, but this one has more stuff in it that oh, I can okay. show. Um, so you know, it, you, and this is a live preview. Uh, if you have the soft subs, this is what you will see. Uh, and uh, over here is your controls. So uh, let's see, where is... Here we go. I, w I was oh, going to yes. ask you to, but yeah, please do yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, um, so, okay, you can go ahead. Uh, so soft subs are basically encoded to a... Usually it's a .mkv file with the video and the audio. And... Uh, it's attached as a file, so it's not baked into the video. So you can enable and disable the subs. And uh, if you want to just watch it straight in Japanese, 
you can just turn off the subtitles and you have pretty much just the raw footage. But if you want the subtitles, you can go into your program like uh, VLC or MPV or whatever you use and uh, turn them on and they'll be there. Um, and then hard sub is the just this except it's burned into the video and uh, you can't disable or enable them. They're just there and uh, most on on those kind of sites, if you get what I mean, they usually take hours off sub and then render their own hard sub for their site. Yeah. Right. But, right. Yeah. But um, uh, so <laughs> that would be weird to watch <laughs> something with text in just a completely random spot. <laughs> yeah. Uh. You have scaling, and then you have uh, 3D rotation as well. If you want to oh, move. wow. <laughs> okay. It's selecting both lines. I wish it wouldn't do that. <laughs> um, and then uh, you have going down here. I'll go to a different shot. Um, so, and here in the box, there's a bunch of... Uh, stuff in curly brackets but these are instructions for the line uh and you can notice down here that there's like little stars where those mm -hmm. instructions are this is basically telling the engine which uh, i forget the name of the engine for these subtitles mm -hmm. but uh uh you know you can set blurs its, its position there's a clipping mask which uh, usually I use that to like oh gosh that. do you have to go frame by frame for that um so, some of them you do some of them you do. oh my gosh um, that would take so much time uh, some, some of it's easier than others like uh, there's a, another shot down here that I did that's uh, here it is here it is so this shot in particular uh, this shot in particular he's uh running across the screen and the mask is exactly the same for each frame at least while he's moving on screen because he doesn't change the position i just have to move it slightly that's good i i, I get what you, you just yeah. move the entire mask right yeah. yes yeah and do you just um, you just like keyframe it at that point so you do one and then another like a second or two later and it fills in or do you have to do it uh, for every frame yeah, you, you have to do it for every frame. AG okay. Sub doesn't have any, like, tweening or something like that. So if you want it, they have, well, I guess they have, like, very basic tweening, but you can't, like, tween masks with it. You have to do that for you. Wow, that, that's, that people, is a lot of work. Some people have developed scripts that uh, you can load that automate some of these processes a little bit. Sometimes for things like motion tracking, they'll be used in combination with programs like Blender. Um, but AESUB does lack automation options in itself. A lot of this stuff is manual if you don't use those scripts. Um, so it, 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 there's different approaches to take to this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I see what you mean about him this moving. This is going back to... Yeah. This is going back to parodies, but this whole episode is also a bit of a parody um, about this... Um, a super popular Japanese YouTuber called Hikakin. Oh. And so this guy <laughs> called Yokokin comes, who's basic, who's supposed to look like Hikakin. And yeah, so, yeah, so once again, Yokai Watch oh, is full. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yokai Watch is full of parodies like this. I got you. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, I mean, you have icons up here that helps you with various things, and then you have your menu bars. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. This is pretty much what we do uh, whenever we're making the subs. This is our view the entire time. Uh, unless we're doing the final checks, then we watch it through VLC and right. uh, note down any inconsistencies but uh this is pretty much where the magic happens so this is like uh the adobe premiere so to speak this is where we construct everything and get it ready um and like i said this is uh 
industry standards. So, you know, that even pros will use this. Mm-hmm. Granted, they won't. They probably won't go to the extent of masking and and clipping. Okay, that's awesome. That's really that's yeah. really really fascinating. Because I I've never like I said I mean I've I've never seen like the back end side of of subtitling. Mm-hmm. No, thank you. Yes, thank you for showing us that because that, that's that's really really cool to see. Just yeah, like it because it, it does remind me of um, like because we 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 use like Vegas right to to edit our videos. So it uh, in some ways I can see like how it's similar, um, but I also see like how much more uh, finesse you have. Uh, in in the exact timing and that's really really cool right well yeah. the, the in the top right that's our like little spectrogram that's how we do the timing usually like when i time at least when i do manual timing sometimes we just time on top of the captions that have time stamps set already but oh. when i do a manual time i'm mostly looking at that bar up there the entire time and there's like you can play with the, the controllers to extend the line and things like that those red and blue bars so yeah. there's also there's all like different facets uh, of the program that you, like you look you're looking at different things depending on what you're doing. Yeah. And this is a free program, by the way. So pretty much anybody can like download this and play with it uh, oh, wow. whenever they want. I don't think it's been updated in a while, but it does <laughs> really no, well. it has not. It has not yeah, been no. updated in a couple of years. Yeah, but sometimes that's program. for the best. <laughs> sometimes up- updates just mess everything up. <laughs> that's true. It's- it is open source though, so uh, oh, there are people out there who are keeping things going and making their own builds. I am actually not using an official build. I'm using uh, this right here. Uh, it's doing that because I have right shift as my push the talk key, but uh, this is not an official build. This is a build that somebody made uh, specifically for Mac that adds a uh, a bit extra functionality compared to the oh. last official Mac release, but okay. um, uh, so yeah, people do keep it going and add features to it. Um, but uh, there hasn't been. Huh. I see. Okay. Well, it's it's good that even though it's it hasn't been updated, it's still doing exactly what you need it to do. So obviously, it was a good program. <laughs> it is a good program. Yeah, there there's some things that I wish it would do, mm-hmm. but uh, for what we need it for, it's fine the way it is. Well, cool. I mean, every every program has limitations and pros and cons. Yeah, so. yeah, of course. Absolutely. Yeah, it's just that. I think the hugest con for this program is the fact that when you zoom in, this little drop down menu to zoom in, though you can select your screen size, it'll only zoom in to the top left. So. Oh can't like zoom into a specific corner or focus on a specific corner it'll only do the top left and that kind of oh it kind of gets annoying if you're trying to be precise anywhere that's not in this upper quadrant but the player or anything like that yeah oh, wow. it's, that's so, the way it, it is. Just doesn't have a full screen option does it for the just player to watch, I... just to watch the video you can just make it as big as you can yeah. probably make it like two hundred percent or something like that, and mm-hmm. it's close enough. But most of the time, you want to have like the the command box on screen so you can type in your tags and the whole script and the spectrogram. So it's 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 probably it's best that it's not full screen at all times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Well, thank you for showing us that. That was very very cool. Yeah. That's, that's not really something that I understand at all. So <laughs> I know you asked briefly about project length. I think. Uh, and yes. it's, it's kind of funny how it can differ sometimes because I think Forever Friends took us like a week and mm-hmm. the Y Academy took us like four months. Oh. So if, but on one hand, I think our Y Academy subs were a lot more polished. Um, and so again, it kind of goes to show you that a lot more goes into this process than meets the eye. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people do take it for granted and they kind of think, I don't know, for all I know, people think it's a machine doing these things. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Uh, part of why we always include credits also to, you know, not just for us, but for when we get outside help, we want to give them credit too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we always put ourselves in the credits and things. Um, since that, yeah, people kind of don't always realize that it's it's other people doing this. And the same even goes for official subs, especially for official subs, because they're so, like, on such a strict time schedule. People mm-hmm. don't realize that 
human translators and subtitlers doing that work either. Um, and so I hope by being so open um, and communicative with the fan base, I, I hope that people come to appreciate the work more. And it, I would, you know, if people get invested in it themselves and want to give it a try, that would be awesome too. Because I remember when I was the person waiting for anime subs because I didn't understand it. And now I'm here doing it. And that's so cool. Yeah, yeah that is awesome. Exactly. I used to watch you guys before I knew what Spectre subs was. I was always waiting for that new episode to drop. It's it's a it's a cool experience for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of things that play into our speed, and uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, sometimes it's there's pretty fast turnaround time from one episode to the other, and sometimes there's not. And uh, you know, we're we're not. This isn't a job. We're not yeah. getting paid. And uh, there's other stuff in the world that we have to worry about, especially given. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I, I used to have more time for this when I first started. I used to do like two episodes a week or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, mostly by myself because it was Nora was doing encoding and QC for me and I was doing the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I don't have as much stamina for that anymore, but I think that's okay too because I think my translation skills and my Japanese skills are a lot better now than they were four years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a bit of a trade-off and I'm not as fast anymore, but when I do do projects, I put as much effort as I can into it. And that kind of goes for all of us. Yeah. 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 I mean, well, it's like you had said oh, earlier, like that, that everybody has to start at the bottom yep. and then, you know, you practice and it's like, you've spent four years doing this. I'm sure like the experiences that you've had have really, you know, shaped the way you do this and have added to the quality that you can offer. Absolutely. And there's people that have done this for even longer. Some people have been doing this for like a decade and a half. Uh, yeah. 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 So, I'm like a small fry in comparison to them, but I think it's really <laughs> fascinating how much the community has evolved over time and the practices have evolved and things like that. Mm -hmm. And the landscape has changed a lot too, because 10 years ago, there weren't the amount of simul uh, subs that we have now. Mm -hmm. right. So mm -hmm. it's a really interesting history, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 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 Yeah. So how long have all of you been doing this? Uh when did I start? 2016, I think I started teaching it to myself, so fair number of years at this point. Wow. Uh, I, I started using it probably the spring of 2019. Okay. And, okay. Uh, yeah, and I it took about a month for me to learn the absolute basics, and uh, I, I just want to say, and I will probably get into this maybe a little bit later, but uh, teaching yourself the absolute basics and thinking I'm ready is not, it's probably not the best advice I'd give somebody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so I I really just joined to be honest mm -hmm. about three and a half months ago. I think that's right. And I've I've been learning Japanese since I was born basically. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I'm Japanese so I my my mom's Japanese, so she wanted me to work. Yeah, so the preschool I went to, for example, was a Japanese private school. I got okay. you. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That, would, that actually leads into my next question is, like, what would you consider your level of proficiency in Japanese? Like, what would all of you consider it? To be honest, I, English is still my primary language, no, no matter what. Mm -hmm. In Japanese, I'd say I'm, I'm like middle to advanced being completely honest. It's just sometimes I don't know what I should say in a Japanese conversation. It's basically, mm -hmm. I, I can, I can have a basic conversation with you and I can I'll most likely understand what you're saying, but I don't know if I'll always have the right words to respond to you with. I think the interesting thing about this question is that, well, I mean, for me, I never took the JLPT, so I yeah. don't have an exact estimate. That, I yeah, totally fair. Never did. 
That's fine. Um, but the interesting thing about this is I think that translating uh, Japanese and like fluency and conversation are two very different skills. Like I know there are professional translators who have like, you know, passed the N1 and all that, but they don't really speak Japanese. So and conversely, there's people who speak Japanese that don't have the skills for translation. So it's all obviously you need to have a good enough understanding of Japanese and the nuances. Yeah to be able to do something like this but you're also not going in without resources like i said before there's so much research and having 15 dictionaries open that goes into yeah. this so um it's it's different skill sets uh for you know between speaking and and doing this so like i'll i'll be i'll be frank and say that i don't really speak or uh, converse mm -hmm. in japanese um i would like to get better at it because i do plan on going there at some point um probably for studying uh but i do this and this has given me a lot of exposure of course i do other studying on the side mm -hmm. um uh, and this has sort of become my skill whereas i'm weaker in other areas and i think that kind of goes for all of us we're all at different um we have different specialties and weaknesses um so yeah i i agree with that i I definitely can comprehend written Japanese way, way more than I can speak it. I'm, frankly, I'm terrible at speaking. So, uh, you know, I, I would say, you know, I've been, I've been studying Japanese since I started high school. And, uh, you know, I, I would like to say I'm at a point probably where if I if I was the age of the kids who this is aimed to, I would be able I would I would have no problem with it. I'd probably place myself around that mark in terms of comprehension, but speaking is a whole different can of worms, and uh, you know that's just the fault on my part. But I, I mean, you know, that's... I I keep myself sharp by trying to read as much as possible um mm -hmm. you know when a japanese option is available for things i'll use it because there's really no such thing as having completely learned a language forever you're always yeah. learning a second language uh, I, I mean honestly well, i feel like you're always learning your first language th that's what i was gonna I say mean, that, it's like i said this the stinking script that he wrote with the bakes on fire or whatever it was cooking cooking, <laughs> yeah. cooking the books <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I didn't know what that was. You, and, you never, you never really no. stopped learning. And, I mean, I gotta say, as as a learner of Japanese, I am a hundred percent in the exact same boat as all of you. Yep. Like it, yep. like r written Japanese and reading Japanese, it is completely different than mm -hmm. speaking it and understanding when people speak it. Like it, it's like a whole different ball game. So I, I am so there. I know, I know there are people who are in both camps. Like there are, mm -hmm. there are people who are much, much better at listening and speaking. And there are people who are much, much better at reading and writing. And I, I'm, I'm in the same boat where uh, reading and, and writing, I think especially because they don't have the time component, you're not immediately expected to mm -hmm. respond with something that makes them considerably easier, but it's, they're like that. worlds apart. I think we've got like two two more uh, before we wrap this up. Uh, one one would be, what keeps all of you motivated for continuing to do this? Wh whether it's with Spectre subs or whether it's side projects, what ke what keeps you motivated with translating? Uh, well, it, it depends. I think you know when I'm really really invested in the subject matter. Um, you know, I could do it very easily. Like I just, I'm working on a side project now that I'm super excited about, but I'm not going to talk about it yet. Cause I don't know when it's coming out. <laughs> um, so, uh, for Yokai watch, my relationship with Yokai watch is a little complicated these days. Um, <laughs> it's been through so many twists and turns as, as you know, very well, <laughs> um, that I'm more engaged with some parts of the franchise versus others, but I still like fan subbing it regardless, because I just like making people happy with, you know being able to enjoy this media that they love um and i like being able to contribute to that uh and i really like um i think this is a perfect uh sort of skill for me or hobby for me because i am a writer but i'm not very good at coming up with my own stuff so i like i like dissecting what a, an author is putting in place and being able to put my own spin on it while still delivering um what this creator intended to convey to different audiences i just think that's really cool yeah. and so it's a mixture of liking the work and and wanting to help the fans that keeps me going for this despite all of the work that we have to do mm -hmm. for, like for me personally uh 
uh, just like Group said, uh, interest plays a big role in it. So, you know, obviously, since I'm interested in this franchise, uh, I want to see the media. But, uh, you know, I could, I could technically just watch it raw, but I, yeah. I think just watching it with the subtitles, even though I know Japanese, it's just a lot easier on my head. So I was like, well, I could just make them for myself. But then at the same time, be like, well, if other people are going to want to see them, then why not just show everyone? So mm-hmm. that, that, that's what keeps me going. And it, it really, it, it is dependent on, you know, what the subject matter is and how invested I am in the franchise in general. Uh, but that's been pretty steady as of lately. And uh, I, I'm the kind of person who, once I start something, I will... That makes sense. Yeah, it does. For me, it's I I've liked Yokai Watch ever since basically ever since it came out in Japan for like six, seven years. So and the anime was my first exposure ever to Yokai Watch. Mm. So and to be honest, it's been my favorite series ever since ever since then. So and then so and for example, I I used to translate manga for my friends, like, a few chapters at a time. For example, my friend likes Kirby, so I'd translate some of the Kirby manga for him. Stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But then when I found out that I could translate the anime, some the Yokai Watch anime, and that was just... It, it, was, an, it was an amazing feeling that... And even though there aren't that many people who watch us, the... Sm- the small reactions that we get from people are always really nice. Mm-hmm. And there are people, there's still, even though we have a small following, there are still people who support us. And seeing those people, yeah, seeing those people support us this is just a really nice feeling. Well, I get to do something that I really like. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, that's probably what keeps me motivated. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. It's, it's a, it sounds like a, like you all in, in in ways really like the community aspect of 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 fan subbing and connecting with other people. Yeah, ever since we opened up our public Discord server, it's been basically a hub for Yokai Watch fans, and it's been really enjoyable. I think um, for people to get together, especially because this is a more obscure series. Um, it feels really tight knit, even though it's like three hundred people. Oh um, wow! Yeah, I, would, I think we're at, yeah we're at a, around three hundred something like that. Would it be all right if we if it's a public server? Would it be all right if we link it if if people want to join up and you know be part of that? I don't I don't see why not. It's all over our social media. So. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Be, cool. Yeah. So that would be great. We get more people. Check, yeah. Check it out. Check it's, out it's the server. There. Heck, <laughs> I need to check out the server now. I didn't know it existed. I'm. I live under a rock, I, I, y'all. I, so <laughs> okay. we're all busy. <laughs> yes, I guess the last question that we had is like looking to the future. Um, whether you know wh- whether that's like after you translate all 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 of the anime and all of the movies that eventually come out, or um, if you are just like seeking uh, any sort of new employment later in the future. Uh, do do any of you have any interest or uh, aspirations to do subtitling as like a career or anything like that, or do you want to just kind of keep it as a hobby? Or what what do you think? For me, Japanese English translation is in my career plan. Yes, um, since I've been doing it for a few years now, uh, I'm also I'm in college. I'm a linguistics major currently, uh, working for my bachelor's. Uh, so you know I have backup options, but I definitely want to go into the professional industry uh, for Japanese and English at some point. And even though I primarily like doing anime and manga, uh, I would totally be down to branch out to other fields at some point for more opportunities and experiences. I mean, I think one of the most fascinating parts of this for me is learning all sorts of things through the research I do for translation and Mm -hmm. getting different experiences is, it's really cool to me. So yes, I definitely want to do it professionally. Subtitling, again, is like, there's not really a strict captioning role. Again, I think it's like they, the way that they do it at professional industries like Crunchyroll and Funimation is differently from how fans would do it. But if somebody wanted to pay me for it, I would be down. 
I I am a similar I'm in a similar boat. I you know, I I'm also in university right now, but I don't entirely know what I want to do, but uh, you know, it's given the chance I I wouldn't mind going pro with this, but uh, you know, fan subbing in general is kind of it it's not the biggest it's not something you'd put on it's a gray area it, it's the grayest yeah. you could get it's, it's fair <laughs> different, different agencies will have different opinions i've read a lot about this and some put it on their resumes and get hired and some get rejected because of it it's really you, you might want to research into the company and you know things like that oh i see yeah but like you know in general i think yeah I, i'm Assuming that I don't just go pro after we're done with Yokai, you know, I'm sure that I would find somewhere else to go, some other group to join, or, mm -hmm. you know, if, you know, I, my very first project solo was uh, season two of a, a very popular anime, and if it gets a season, it was uh, uh, Karakai Jozo no Takagi-san. It got a second season in 2019, uh, and uh, they it did end up getting licensed by Netflix, but uh, it didn't get licensed until later that year, but it started broadcasting in July, and at the time, I was just like, you know what, what the hell, I'll do it, and... Uh, so I that was the anime I was talking about earlier that I did the That's right. I got it like twenty four hours after they aired and it was it you know, as much as I enjoyed doing it, I there's a lot of things I would go back and do over again to make them better, but uh uh that was probably that was probably what got me Cause, at, cause at the time I was like, uh, I do like doing this, but do I really want to go all the way? And then doing that and seeing that the response that I got, cause you know, since I, since I mentioned it was popular anime, it wasn't like Yokai Watch where, I, I mean, now we still get a sizable amount of views, like mm -hmm. a couple hundred, like pretty fast. But that, that anime, I would, I would get like a couple thousand um downloads within the day and then i would get you know this is a true story too at the time i had a capped internet connection mm -hmm. and uh since i was the only one uh hosting the file uh and a lot of people had me on their rss feed on their clients so immediately when i posted oh and no since it's since oh. it's a peer-to-peer -peer thing i'm it, i drove up my my internet bill about 60 to 75 dollars each oh, good. i was doing that because of the amount of traffic i'd get oh my um, gosh but seeing you know seeing the, it really didn't hit me until um like I'd say like two, about a month into doing that series mm -hmm. that uh, one of my friends had uh, found this YouTube video online. Uh, people were clipping the episodes and they were clipping the songs I was doing mm -hmm. and they were getting hundreds of thousands of views and people were really happy that they were being able, they could watch it because it wasn't getting actual subs at the time. And, you know, I, I, I'd be miffed to take full credit for that because I did have someone helping me out with translation at the time. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but uh, it just, the reach of the, of my subs for that was astronomical. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw feedback from people from those YouTube comments. I got a bunch of negative feedback too, which is, which tied into what I mentioned earlier about, mm -hmm. uh, just not learning the basics and uh, oh. going from there because that was at a time where I I had a very basic idea of what I was doing and it was very obvious while watching that I was kind of learning as I went mm -hmm. and uh, you know that wasn't really the best look looking back and I would um, yeah even despite that I could go back and 
to bring everything up to the standard that I have now. But, uh, you know, despite all the negative attention that I had, uh, that I had gotten at the time, um, I, at the end of the day, I still had a bunch of people thanking me and that really kind of like, uh, it would just, it kind of clicked in my head. Like I want to do this because if I could get just a fraction of what yeah. I, yeah. that's awesome. I think having I think that the... passion is so important. And what were you saying? Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say the fun slash nerve wracking part of this is that we don't really know the true extent of our audience because of the way that these are distributed peer to peer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then other sites take them and put them on their sites. Right. So we could have thousands of people watching for all we know. But, and you know, and then people even on YouTube re upload mm -hmm. uh, our stuff yeah. and we'll get hundreds of thousands of views. So we don't know the true extent of our audience. But I, I, on one hand, I think it makes it kind of cool that, um, you know, we could be touching so many people's lives with this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, you definitely reached us. Yeah. That that is oh, that you. is for sure. Uh, clap. Do you want to go? I forgot if you answered. Oh, yeah, um, I I haven't. Um, oh yeah. Well, I don't. The thing is, so yeah, until a month or two ago, it was just a hobby, and I wanted to pursue something else. But the thing is, the more I do it, it's really fun, and I'm debating whether I do want to follow this, and mm -hmm. I might. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well and that's exciting too like just the prospect of like what will i do i yeah <laughs> you know yeah. like yeah i think it's i think it's a side of i i think it's a side of like the anime community that is like double removed because it's like you were talking about people who get paid to do subtitling like even if they do get credit they're not usually like known to the people watching the anime but then when you go to fan subbing it's like two steps removed from that where it's i don't know it's it's because it's not in a in, in a quote-unquote like official capacity it makes it even more obscure in some ways but there's like so much there's so much that goes into it and there's so much history there mm -hmm. that it's i i find it really fascinating i think official translators too sometimes they don't get credited which is really sad in my opinion yeah. because like mm -hmm. i said translation is such an art form and each translator brings a particular artistry to, to what they do and bring out the author's original work in a different way and so mm -hmm. i think it is said that a lot of the times translators on even paid official work don't get uh credited depending on the company yeah um yeah. so that's definitely something to bring awareness to you know not just in terms of fan groups in terms of official things also just how important that this um this craft is to to the industry and the media that people love yeah absolutely well, I, I am so appreciative to each and every one of you yes. for coming on and hanging out with us for almost two hours. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was nice. I think we had a lot of good discussions and had a lot of good points, and I was glad to contribute to this. Yeah, yeah same. I agree. I, I immensely enjoyed this talk. I yeah. definitely, I know, I definitely learned a lot. I learned so much. This was so. amazing for me. Well, I could do this all day. I want to do this. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like this was awesome, and, yeah. and I, I really appreciate your openness. I really appreciate you know you coming on and even giving us some of the like behind the scenes of what you're doing. Um, you know, even with some projects that you're working on that are going to be released for a little while. That's that's I'm just so appreciative that you uh, brought that to us and we're yeah. able to share that with everyone and. Um, I encourage all of our viewers, please go yes. check out Sep um, Spectre subs. Like, yes. go see what they have. Check, check the description. There, all the links will be in there. Go join join their Discord. Yes. Check them out on Twitter. Check out what they offer. All of it. These people are amazing. They do <laughs> they do awesome stuff. Yes. Um, and and that goes you know to, that goes for all fan subbers. You know, and I know you all are a smaller group, but you know all, all of these shows that we're able to experience and enjoy is because of people like you who put in the time and dedication to do this kind of stuff. And that is that is amazing, uh, truly amazing. Um, and it's a thankless job. And I, I just want to say wholeheartedly, thank you so much. <laughs> yes, thank, thank you. Thank you for all that you do. Absolutely. <laughs>